Take your Bible this evening, if you would. Genesis chapter 11, please. Genesis chapter 11 for our scripture reading. We're going to read the first nine verses of Genesis chapter 11. We'll read them responsibly, as we normally do, beginning together on verse 1. Then I'll read 2, alternating till we end together on verse 9 of Genesis chapter 11. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word together. Let's begin together on verse 1 of Genesis 11. Ready? And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city." Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for preserving it and keeping it for us that we hold copies in our hand tonight. And I pray, Lord, that as you have spoken to us already through the music and the songs we've heard tonight, that you would prepare us and speak to us through your word as well. Lord, quiet our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'd focus our attention, that we'd be ready to receive the truth you have for us tonight from your word. Bless the special, please. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. Than to be the queen of a vast domain, or be held in sin's red sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords to. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be true to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the queen of the vast domain or be held in sin's red sweat. 
Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now as we come to the preaching of your word. Lord, I'm praying and asking you tonight now that you would speak to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you that he makes it all possible for us to be here tonight. And Lord, the, the love we have for you because you first loved us. Lord, I ask you to help us as we look into this chapter in the book of Genesis and this story of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel and help us to glean some truths tonight that will help us that, Lord, will let us see just who Nimrod was and that what the characteristics that he had that we do not want to have in our lives. Lord, help us to be people that seek you, that love you, that desire to bring glory to you and you alone. So, Father, bless our study here this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. In Genesis chapter 11, if your Bible's open to that, you understand that all the population of the world, all the peoples of the world, have descended from Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Um, Shem and his descendants, of course, became the Hebrews, and the Syrians. It's through Shem that the seed continues of the Messiah. And Ham's descendants are that of North Africa and the Far East, and Japheth's descendants would be the European people. Uh, that most of us would have come from. Now, this is one of those areas of the Bible. For instance, you remember Genesis chapter 1 when God created everything in six days and then rested the seventh day. It talks about on the sixth day he created male and female. Then in chapter 2, you have the details of that. You have how he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he took the rib out and he created him. He's just giving us the details of what happened that it spoke of in a general sense in chapter 1. And what you have in chapter 10 is you have the listing of the three sons of Noah and, and their children. And it says in verse 32, These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations, what? Divided in the earth after the flood. So it tells us that they were divided now, chapter 11 is going to tell us how they became divided. Okay? How did this come about that God divided them out and scattered them, so to speak, to different places? And so we get the details. And in chapter 11, we're introduced to a character uh, by the name of Nimrod. All right? Now, I did not know until I started looking into this a little bit uh, <clears throat> that. Nimrod is actually something that's a slang term. I guess it's in the Oxford Dictionary. There's a slang Oxford Dictionary that has slang words in it. And Nimrod uh, means a simpleton, a nerd. Okay? In other words, Johnny's a total Nimrod. He does such dumb things. All right? So when I said don't be a Nimrod, I had no idea that that was a don't be a nerd. You know, I didn't know that. But... 
I'm thinking of this guy in the Bible is who I'm thinking about. And so I just uh, I, I want to call us to, to not, not be a Nimrod, but let's look and see just who Nimrod was, okay, and try to understand uh, what, his, what his characteristics was. And you, you'll see as this unfolds that he's not a fellow that you want to be like. Nimrod, first of all, is one who lives in rebellion against God. Nimrod lives in rebellion against God. The Bible says in, in verse 8, The Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore the name was called Babel, because the Lord there did confound the language of the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. And you, you originally find Nimrod uh, over in chapter 10. If you look in chapter 10, in verse number 8, it's about Cush. Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. This is Nimrod. Nimrod comes from a word that means to rebel. In fact, his name means, let us rebel. Okay? Nimrod is mentioned as a mighty hunter, and he was a, uh, the, according to history and what people have written, uh, they believe he gained that fame by subduing the horse and using a leopard to hunt wild beasts. He would tame a leopard and then use them to hunt the wild beast. But Nimrod, the key phrase is before the Lord. He put himself before God. He was rebelling against God. Someone else put themselves before God as well, if you recall. Named, named, the, the created angelic being named Lucifer, who said, I will be like the Most High, I will sit in the throne of God. And so Nimrod lived in rebellion against God. Rebellion is always satanic. Rebellion is always satanic. Um, the, the, the sin that cost Saul the kingdom, rebellion. What did, what did the Lord say? In 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It's satanic. Rebellion is always satanic. In the Proverbs, some of you read, how many of you read Proverbs through once every month and uh, you read it through daily? There's a word in Proverbs called froward. Froward. Not forward. Froward. F R O W A R D. Froward. That is, that is unwillingness to comply with what's required. You know what it is? It's rebellion. Okay? And you read them many times through there in Proverbs about the froward person that the Lord stands against. And so uh, rebellion is in our nature. Rebellion is in our sin nature. We, we don't like to be told what to do. Okay? How many times you heard somebody say, don't tell me how to live. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. It always amazes me sometimes you get rebellious teenagers who... Say, ah, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to go join the army. Or I'm going to join the navy. And you think, boy, have you got another thing coming. Uh, you don't understand what you're saying. Um, the rebellion. You know, rebellion always hurts the rebel. It doesn't hurt necessarily the one you're rebelling against, but it always hurts you. I read where the Fox River and the Chain of Lakes waterways of northern Illinois, the officials face annually a very expensive problems. They have about 600 buoys there on the waterway that, that uh, marks where the shallow water is, where they can't, the, the speedboats cannot cause too big of a wake and things like that. And uh, they mark those out. Of the 600 of them, I want you to know the attrition rate for those plastic buoys is about... 125 percent they have to replace more than more than each of them over 125 percent every year why people purposefully destroy them and now now if they're destroyed and you can't tell where the water may be getting too shallow for your boat then who are you hurting <laughs> you're hurting yourself but that's always the case with rebellion it's always the case. Hey, the prodigal rebelled and said, I'm going to leave home. I know best. Who'd that end up hurting? It ended up hurting himself. He's the one who ended up in the pig pen, looking at the pig slop, thinking it looked pretty good. 
It didn't hurt dad at home. It hurt him. And it always hurts the rebel, not the one who he's rebelling against. And so it'll bring you great pain if you want to live in rebellion against God. So Nimrod lives in rebellion against God. By the way, you'll, you'll never win living in rebellion against God. That's not where you want to be. Some of you have been saved long enough and you may have went through a period of time in your life when you lived rebelling against God uh, and it's some of the most awful, horrific time of your life. It's miserable living in rebellion against God. It, 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 isn't, it isn't harming God, but it sure is harming you. It always hurts the rebel. Number two, to be Nimrod, or if you're gonna, not going to be a Nimrod, when, when you're Nimrod, you rely upon your own might. You rely upon your own strength. He was a mighty hunter. A mighty hunter before the Lord. Always talking about mighty men. Just back a few chapters in Genesis. Chapter 6. Would you turn there with me? Genesis chapter 6. The Bible says... Uh, right before verse 5, which is very familiar to us about the imagination, the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. But verse 4 says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in under the daughters of men and they bare children unto them, the same became, what's the next two words? Mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, they were mighty men, but they were not mighty in God. They were mighty in their own strength. They were mighty in their own thoughts. They were mighty in their own ways. And thinking that they were strong and they were powerful. Look with me at Psalm 33. Would you turn to the book of Psalms? Psalm 33. Notice with me in Psalm 33, verse number 16. The psalmist pens this, There is no king saved by the multitude of a host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Saying, listen, a king, and that's why God always told David, what did he tell David about numbering the army of Israel? Yeah. Don't do it. Why? Because you'll rely on your strength. Uh, who's... who's Who's the strength of Israel? Is it their army? No. Is it their horses? No. It was God. God was to be their strength, not human might. Uh, look at Psalm 147. Psalm 147. A little bit deeper in the Psalms there, towards the end. Psalm 147. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 10. He delighteth, he delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of of a man. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that what? Fear him and in those that hope in his mercy. God says, I don't take pleasure in a man that takes pleasure in his strength. I take pleasure in those that fear me and that hope in me and that rely upon me and my strength. Now, look at Second Chronicles. Go back to your left there, if you will. I want you to look at this man named Asa. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, or Uzziah rather, I'm sorry. 2 Chronicles 26. 2 Chronicles 26, look at verse number 15. Well, let's back up to verse 14. Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host shields, spears, helmets, habergeons, bows, and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. They had somehow automated things that could shoot arrows and stones. Quite, quite an amazing invention for his day. I mean, these were, these were smart guys. And, and he made all these weapons of war to fight the battle. But notice what the Bible says. And his name spread far abroad. For he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. 
For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of the Lord. And of course, God took care of it. But notice what it says. When he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his what? Destruction. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. I, I, I don't like it when I hear Christians talk how strong they are. Well, I wasn't sure I could go through that, but boy, I was surprised at how strong I was. Boy, don't brag about your strength. You should brag about how strong God is and how God helped me through that. And God gave me the strength. Paul, Even Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me or strengtheneth me. Look at Jeremiah chapter 9. Would you look over there with me, please? Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah 9, look with me if you would at verse number 23. Notice what the Lord said. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. What do you glory in? You don't glory in your strength. You don't glory in your might. You don't glory in your intellect. You don't glory in your riches. You don't glory in your resources. We glory in the fact we know God, that we can rely on Him. Nimrod didn't do that. He relied on his own strength. Do you trust in yourself or do you trust in God? Do you rely on your own wisdom and your own ideas and your own way? Or do you look to God to help you with things? Sometimes, I, you know, do you just say, well, I'll figure this out? Or you come to a situation and say, well, I don't know what we're going to do. We'll figure something out. Then you're relying on yourself. You're, you're looking to yourself to figure it out. In Leadership Magazine, uh, Ben Patterson, who is dean of a chapel of Hope College and a former pastor, wrote this. He said, in the spring of 1980, I was suffering from great pain and what was diagnosed as two herniated discs in my lower back. The prescription was for total bed rest. But since my bed was too soft, he said it ended up being total floor rest. Uh, I was frustrated and humiliated. I couldn't preach. I couldn't lead meetings. I couldn't call on new prospects. I couldn't do anything but pray. And he said, I did not immediately grasp that last fact. It took me two weeks to get so bored, I finally asked my wife for the church directory so I could at least do something, even if it was, even if it was only pray for the people of my congregation. And notice, he said it was, it was boredom and frustration that drove me to pray. But pray I did. Every day for every person in my church. Two or three hours a day. After a while, he said, the time became sweet. Toward the end of my convalescence, anticipating my return to work, I prayed, Lord, this has been good. This praying, it's too bad I don't have time to do this when I go back to work. <laughs> and God spoke to my heart and said, you have the same 24 hours each day when you're strong as well as when you're weak. The only difference is when you're strong, you think you're in charge. Most of the time, we don't pray because we're handling it. And when we think we can handle it, we don't consult God. Prayer is an indication that we realize how weak we are and we need Him. We need Him. Most Christians struggle with prayer because we struggle with self-sufficiency. We can do it on our own. And so we don't bother praying. Relying on God, trusting on Him. When you're, you're weak, you know you're weak. And you have to rely on God. And the truth is, whether you think you are or not, you're weak. You're weak. 
The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Don't rely on yourself. Nimrod. Nimrod always thinks he's getting it done, but he gets it done in his own power. I'm not interested in getting things done in my own power, in my own strength. The other, in fact, it was the other day. Um, I don't know what day it was, Kathy. My wife said something about all the, she was listing out all the things that she was able to get accomplished in, in the day. And it made me, I don't know what all it was, but I was tired listening to it. <clears throat> and she said, and you know what? She said, I took time to read my Bible this morning. How about that? See, all these things that you had to get accomplished, and the flesh would say, get at it. Let's go. Come on. You don't have time to sit here and read this. Too many things to do. Anybody else's mind work that way? Huh? But when you take time and you put God first, you ask for His strength and His might, it's amazing how many things you get accomplished in a day. It's amazing. His strength, not your strength. Number three, the third characteristic of Nimrod is Nimrod builds his own kingdom. He builds his own kingdom. Go back to the book of Genesis again, if you would. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 10, and notice verse number 10, where it says, In the beginning of his kingdom, that's Nimrod, beginning of his what? His kingdom was Babel. And then it lists Eric and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. All right? He, he begins to build a kingdom called Babel. It was, it was a Babylonian term that means the gate of God. The gate of God. The Hebrews called it Belial, and meaning to confound. Babel was what uh, was called Babylon by the Greeks and the Romans. Of course, the city reached its height of its glory underneath Nebuchadnezzar when they were taken captive and Daniel was one of the ones taking there. You know, Nebuchadnezzar built the hanging gardens for the queen who was homesick for her homeland. Listen to this. There were 50 miles of double walls built around the city. The inner walls were 21 feet wide. The outer walls 11 feet wide. But wait, they were built that wide so chariots could transport soldiers quickly to points of defense if they were under attack. The walls reached a height of 300 feet and were reinforced by 420-foot towers every 60 feet along the wall. It had been an amazing sight to see, I think. The waters of the Euphrates River were diverted to form a moat around the walls of the city. The city was divided into rectangles with roads and gates named after the Babylonian gods. The homes were whitewashed to cover the gray clay of the homes and they painted their door frames red because red was regarded as the color which frightened and kept away the devils. Barred and... and it barred him from evil influences. Babylon, as you know, was once the capital of Assyria. And it's interesting. So here's Babylon, which is meaning the, uh, what did I say earlier, the, the gate of God, or the, really the center of idolatry throughout the world at that time. And that's where God chooses to send his people into captivity for idolatry. He sends them to the capital of idolatry. And the Jews were reminded that, uh, that confusion always comes as a result of idolatry and worshiping false gods. It's always confusion. God is not the author of confusion. The Babylon Empire was part of Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 2. It's the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now, Nimrod's kingdom that he tries to build had a couple characteristics in it. Number one, it focused on human unity. Notice what he said in chapter 11, verse 1. They were all of one language, of one speech, and, and it, they journeyed from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And that's where they said one to another, we're going to build something right here. It's, it's very similar to the kingdom of the Antichrist. You read about that in Revelation chapter 17. 
and 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 it's a it's a coming together. It's all about human unity. We still hear that talked about today, throughout the world. Our 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 president right now is is being blistered uh, through the press and other and other politicians for not going along with everybody, not being part of the Paris Treaty and uh, the climate change. Uh, thing and saying no, I'm not going along with that. Not not going to ride in your boat anymore on that. And and we're being uh, uh, excoriated for that. And 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 listen, we don't. The, the the whole thing is unity. Unity. You hear that all the time. It started really back in the '60s, I think, with the hippie movement. Really, the '60s started the time of astrology. And people ask you, what's your sign? Uh, what sign are you under? Uh, became a common greeting, and 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 they they wanted peace and freedom and and all of that kind of thing, and uh, that that started not really in the 60s. It started back here in Babel, in Babylon, in the land of Shinar. Now, God, let, let me just put put this in here. I think it's a good place to put it. God repeatedly warned Israel about running their lives or looking to the stars for guidance. All right. Astrology is condemned by the Bible. Why would you look to the stars for guidance and for direction in your life when you can look to the one who put the stars in their place? Why would you do that? You know, Jeremiah 10 and verse 2 says, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. It's the heathen that are dismayed by what they see in the sky. God says, don't you learn their ways. You're not looking to the skies. You're looking to the God who made the skies. You're not looking to the stars and the alignment of the planets. You're looking to the God who put the planets in their place. Nimrod always tries to unify mankind and leave God out of the picture. Don't want anything to do with God. We're seeing that emphasis today. But listen, we emphasize, we, we, we only unite based on truth. We only unite biblically, spiritually, religiously, if you want to use that term, based on doctrine. Jesus said, sanctify them through, through thy truth, thy word is truth. If we don't agree on the truth of the word of God, we're not going to have unity. We're not going to be able to get along. If, if there's uh, folks who want to, let's just, hey, we all believe in Jesus. Let's just get together. We have the cry today, just believe in Jesus. doesn't matter what your doctrine is. Oh, no. It matters what your doctrine is. It matters what Jesus you're talking about. The, the, right now, the Latter-day Saints, as they want to be called, the Mormon church, they want to be accepted as an evangelical church. Evangelical simply means as a gospel-preaching church. Well, they, they cannot be that because the Jesus they talk about is not the Jesus of the Bible. It's not the same Jesus. So we have problem with truth, see? And so we cannot go along with that. They don't believe the truth. And we, we unify only on truth. To do anything else is to betray the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't do that. So he not only focused on human unity at the expense of truth, but he also focused on human ingenuity. You ever think about why they built the Tower of Babel? Maybe they thought they'd protect themselves from another flood. Going to get tall enough that water won't reach us. Possibly. The mountains were considered to be the dwelling places of the gods, for they were high in the sky. They, the Babylonians actually believed there was a mountain in the east where the sun rose, and where, where, where the gods would assemble one time a year and kind of set the destiny for the universe. So men would build high towers to meet God halfway, so to speak. And they wanted to build one that would reach to heaven. You saw that and read that. The tower may have been used for military purposes, maybe a lookout position. The tower could have could have been just a landmark. People could see it from a great distance to be able to know that this is, uh, that's where the city is and they could see it from a long way off. You know, 
whatever the reason is, human wisdom, man's wisdom, man's reasoning always falls short of meeting man's real needs. It never fulfills. Because the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. If God's not building it, it's not going to succeed. And you know, there's a lot of people today, they're busy building things, they're busy thinking of things, they're busy doing things, and the things don't matter. Why would you want to succeed in something that isn't going to matter for eternity? And we're so busy doing all the things. The devil gets young families so busy going here, going there, getting the kids involved in everything. And where does God fit in? He's just somewhere we tag Him in when we can. And we're busy. Busyness. Building fortunes, building businesses, building, uh, building up our lives, building up a name, but neglecting their relationship with God. Having success and having power, but what did it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Nimrod builds everything but a relationship with God. Nimrod accomplishes much but never accomplishes getting to know God. He leaves that out completely. Builds his own kingdom but never seeks God's kingdom. Never seeks to, to know God. So he lives in rebellion against God. He relies on his own might. He builds his own kingdom. The fourth thing I see about Nimrod is he focuses on human glory. He said, let us make a name for ourselves. Let us make us a name. He wanted to be known. Can we, can we, can we agree on something? We're not here to make ourselves known. We're here to make Him known. We're here to let folks know about Jesus Christ. We're here to let folks know about God. It's not about us. It's not about who we are. The devil is always offering people glory if they'll fall down and worship Him. He started it with Jesus in the temptation in the wilderness. All this I'll give to you if you fall down and worship me. Proverbs 25, verse 27 said, It's not good to eat much honey, so for one to seek his own glory is not good. Don't seek to make a name for yourself. What did, what did Nebuchadnezzar learn when he wanted to make a name for himself and he got proud and lifted up? Remember what God did to him? He became an animal. And, and he lived that way. Ate grass. And, and, and you read about it in Daniel chapter 4. Herod learned the same lesson. He gave a speech and everybody thought, oh, it's the voice of God and not man. And Herod in his best Barney Fife went, yeah, that's right. That's me. I'm pretty good. And boy, when he refused to give God the glory, God struck him dead just like that. Worms come out of his body. Read about that in Acts chapter 12. I don't know about you, but don't, Listen, God doesn't share His glory with anyone. Make sure that you live for His glory. What that mean? That means you put the light on God, not on you. It means you put all the spotlight on Him, not on yourself. It's what God, it's what we, we give glory to Him. And you know, this is where the church has really lost its way. We, we think it's a good service if the people are pleased. This, this church service is not about you and me being pleased. It's about God being pleased. See, the, the whole, this whole idea of the, what, what they call a seeker-sensitive church are, are this, what, what, what some have written a book called a purpose-driven church now for years. And the whole idea is, is just, just give a survey of the people and see what they want in church and then give them what they want. And, and, and sadly... Bible-believing, Bible-preaching Baptist churches are buying into this. And they're saying, well, this is what people want. This is what we'll give to people. 
So that way people will come and they'll like our church. The goal isn't to get people to like the church. The goal is to get God to like your church. God's to be pleased with what goes on here. The worship of God here is not for us to be pleased. It's for God to be pleased. Is God honored? In all things, He is to have the preeminence. The glory isn't for us. The glory is for God. The honor is not for us. The honor is for God. Successful service is not where we're pleased, but where God is pleased. You know, Nimrod just does as he pleases with no regard for God's will and God's way or God's word. Just living for himself. And man, man can be that way. Guess what? We all can be that way. We all can get pretty stiff-necked. We all can get pretty stubborn. And, and we don't want to live to please God. We just want to live to please ourselves. But when we do that, we're getting the glory, not God. Not God. I want to live for God's glory. So Nimrod lived in rebellion against God. He relied on his own might. He builds his own kingdom. He focuses on his own glory. And then he focuses on human possibility. Verse 5 and 6, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which children of men builded. The Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Put that with verse 4, About go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the old earth. By the way, don't forget who scattered them abroad. God did. They didn't want to do what God wanted them to do. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to do what, and they wanted to, they want to build something to show what they can do. Human possibility. Now, let me say this. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Man is an amazing creature. And you think of the technology, you think of the things that we we do things now that people 100 years ago could not have imagined. You couldn't imagine that somebody, listen, that somebody sitting in their house could watch you and me have church. But they do that now. And, and you don't, you know, uh, you remember when the computers first came out? Brother Dean, it would take one about the size of your whole room there to <laughs> That's how big they were. Who would have thought that, and by the way, later on, even when you had the, the uh, what do they call those, desktop computers, there, there are not many of those around anymore either, but you have those, and, and they used to be pretty big and bulky. You used to, uh, and now, what you hold in your hand does more than those ever did. What you hold in the palm of your hand. It's unbelievable. The technology, you know, when you think that, <clears throat> even automobiles just became available about 100 years ago. And look what we have nowadays. Charles Lindbergh made the first transatlantic flight in 1927. And now, listen, by the tens of thousands, people go across that ocean all the time. Television didn't become widely available until after World War II. I mean, the advances that mankind has made in the last hundred years is boggling. I think in the last 50 years it's boggling. Cell phones, artificial hearts, the computers, the communication satellites, the World Wide Web, on and on and on. And I can see and I understand where some people get focused on what humans can do and, and, and not think about what God can do. But of all the things that man has done, of all the things that man's accomplished, has it satisfied man? Has it, has it brought any peace and comfort to mankind? No. Has it satisfied any real deep need or longing in the heart of man? No. Not at all. People are more restless and more upset and more frustrated than, than they ever have been. All these inventions... 
Has it kept anybody from dying? Has it, has it brought life back to anybody who has passed away? Has it given and can it give eternal life to anybody? No. Not, not a bit. Can it cause everything in your life to work out for good? <laughs> no. It doesn't do any of that. The Lord, the end result of what Nimrod tried to do is the Lord came down, of course, and he confounded the languages of all the earth, and then he scattered them again upon the face of the earth and scatters them out to the different places of the world. Now I want you to look with me, go from Genesis, the first book, to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 18. Go to the last book, the book of Revelation. Revelation 18. And there's an end result of another kingdom in another city. After these things, verse 1, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and, that ho and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Again, this is, this is a, a Babylon of the future, that it's interesting, just as Babylon was the place of false gods, notice it's become the habitation of devils and of every foul spirit. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven. God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And it's all about the demise of, of the commercial Babylon in the day of the tribulation, the, the, the days of the Antichrist. And listen, the destruction comes in one hour. Can you bring a country to its knees in one hour? We, we pretty much saw that in 2001 with the takedown of just two buildings. It, it stopped all the banking. It stopped all the airplanes. America came to a standstill on 2001. And, and it took less than an hour for two buildings to come down. My friend, it can happen. And that's God's judgment upon commercial Babylon. Now listen, the question you ask yourself tonight, honestly, you have to ask yourself, am I a Nimrod? Do I live in a rebellion against God? Do I rely on my own might? and not God's strength? Do I build my own kingdom? Am I focused on what I can do and my ingenuity and, and, and what, what we people can do? Or am I focused on what God can do? You know, you ever seen, you ever seen Greyhounds race? I haven't been there personally at a racetrack. I have seen it in movies. They, they're very fast sleek dogs 
And what they do is they, 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 they run, but they, they're chasing a rabbit. You know what I'm talking about, Danny? You've been there. I know you have. I can tell. You're, you've been. And they, they, they set this mechanical fur rabbit, and he starts going around the rail, and they let these dogs loose, and they're all chasing after the rabbit. Now, they're never going to catch him. They're not going to get to him, but they're running after him, and for all it's worth. That's, by the way, that's what the world does. It chases things that it'll never catch. It chases after things that they think will bring happiness. I'm amazed sometimes over here at Speedway when I watch people come out and they, they'll go in and they'll buy 25 of these lottery tickets at a time. Sit in their car and go through them, you know. Or they scratch off, see if they can get $2. And they go in and get more. It's, it's just sad to me to see that happen. Well, at a Florida track, Brother Danny, the gun went off and the little mechanical rabbit took off. The dogs took off in hot pursuit. But there was an electrical short in the system. <laughs> and the rabbit came to a complete stop and then blew up and exploded in flames. <laughs> the dogs didn't know what to do. They were very bewildered. One news report said several dogs simply stopped running and laid down on the track. Two dogs, still frenzied with the, what had happened, ran into a wall, breaking ribs. Another dog began chasing his tail. And the rest stood there and just howled at the people in the stands. Not one dog kept running and finished the race. Not one. Do you understand what's going to happen when Christ comes back? It's, it's going to short circuit what the world's been living for and believing in. You think, you think there was chaos or confusion on 9-11? Wait till Jesus comes back. Yeah. There'll, be, there'll be such confusion in this world. They, you you just, just think of the chaos that'll take place on this earth and all the things that they were hoping in and wishing for and living for is short-circuited. I understand the rise of the Antichrist. There'll be somebody come on the scene and will say, I can fix this. I can get you your money back. I can get things set up. We can do this. We can do this. And you know what? People will say, anything. Just give me my money back. Put some food in my stomach. We have a whole, listen, we have a whole generation of people that just say, government, just give me, pay for my college, give me food, give me this, give me that, and I'll, I'll, I'll vote anybody you want. We see the world getting set for that. And, and they're not prepared at all for God. Not, certainly not prepared at all for Jesus Christ. Listen, don't be, don't be a Nimrod. Let's live for God. Let's, let's keep focused on what's really important. Let's not live for our glory. Let's live for His glory. Let's not see just what we can do. Let's see what God can do. Let's not try to do it in our strength. Let's do it in God's strength. Let's look to Him. Let's be what he wants us to be.